Can you both give me your first memories of your very first draft experience and um, what that was like? It's changed so much over the years as far as the the glitz and the glamour. What were each of your first experiences like? Are you talking about here with the Rams or just in general? In in general, your first memory. Oh man, that, that's hard. I mean, I probably remember, uh, you know, one of the first things that comes to mind was, you know, the debate a handful of years ago, whether it was going to be Mario Williams or Reggie Bush. Um, you know, that was when I was in college following the draft, but you know, I mean, I, I can remember I've, I've always followed it since I was a little kid. Um, you know, but they've done a good job of continuously making it a skeptic, you know, a spectacle that everybody wants to pay attention to. And that's why it's good to be in the NFL. For you, Les? Maria, I got to go way back. I'm, I'm skipping school, probably in middle school. But I, and, and then those days, it seems like it was during a, it was during the week. So it was probably Monday, maybe a Monday and Tuesday. But I, my, the vision that came to my mind, I remember skipping school one time in the Pittsburgh Steelers taking, uh, Louis Lips and, uh, he was a receiver. And one of my, uh, best friends way back in U Fall, Alabama was a big Steeler fan, still is a big Steeler fan. So I remember, Obviously, you couldn't uh, – didn't have text or anything like that, but there were cell phones at the – I mean, my bad, uh, pay phones. And I remember him calling me, and I said, hey, the Steelers have Lewis Lips. So that's it, Maria. And then what about um, as in working with the Rams, what are your first memories there? Go ahead, Les. You know what, Sean, you know what the thing that came to my mind? longer tenure than me. Well, my, well, it, I, I would go this, and I'll, I'll instead of the the first the first draft. I mean, that, the first draft was when we had, I think, the two pick, and we ended up trading probably with Sean and the Redskins. They moved into that pick to take RG three. But w- I remember working with Sean. I do remember our first draft together. Sean's moved out here, and we're doing a lot of our draft meetings at the Four Seasons because you didn't have a home yet, and. And so I would meet you there uh, in the evenings. And, and that's when we discussed, you know, strategies and draft philosophies and players and things like that. Yeah, I would say uh, one of the you know most memorable experiences was going on the road with Les and Zach Taylor and Matt LaFleur, Shane Waldron, a handful of guys and kind of went on the workout circuit. We worked out Evan Ingram and Gerald Everett and Cooper Cup and Zay Jones and you know, there was a handful of guys that, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun with, ended up with two of those guys that were big parts of it. And obviously we know, uh, you know, how the Cooper things worked out, but that was, uh, that was a great experience being able to go through that, um, you know, and identify, that was kind of one of the first times I'd gone through a, a situation like that where you worked out a handful of guys in a short amount of time. And, you know, Taiwan Taylor was a part of that as well. There was a, there was a lot of guys we worked out that uh, it was fun to be able to kind of see those See those guys work up close and personal. Thanks very much. Hey guys, um, hope you're doing well. This question is for both of you, if possible. Um, Just wondering, as you guys have uh, sort of started to set your board, um, what your major takeaways and trends were of this draft class. Um, you hear a lot of chatter about how it's a very unusual one uh, for a couple of different reasons, particular in the, in the first and second rounds. And obviously as you guys get closer to where you pick um, where you're seeing sort of clusters of positions uh, start to stand out and, and um, which positions those might be. John, I'll say Jordan, I think the, the biggest cluster of picks is there's a lot of players that we have in a cluster of, you know, they won't be there when we pick. Um, And that's, that's, I mean, that's probably the, the, the biggest cluster, which is, which is interesting, you know, from that, I think like every draft, uh, it all it all depends on right what what maybe your needs are, what what your your scheme is, uh, just because some positions might be deep that you know players might not fit fit our scheme. So I, I do think what we tried to hone in on and spend a lot of time on is 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 attempt to earmark right players uh, that we do think will be available at different parts of the draft when we're p- picking and and trying to earmark the, you know, figure out which one of those players have a, you know, a specific use for us in some type of role. And, and at, that, at that point in time, we got to figure out if we handicap this draft correctly as it goes, as it plays out. 
Yeah, it's definitely been unique. I mean, even for us, you know, with our first pick being at 104, but, you know, Les and his group, um, you know, James Gladstone, Jake Temme, they've done such a good job of really identifying guys based on, you know, previous years, um, this year's draft, and, and a lot of different information that you're gathering to kind of really try to hone in. And, you know, the, the nice thing for us is in a lot of instances, it'll kind of naturally work itself out for us as the, uh, you know, the first three rounds unfold as we have the second to last pick in the third round. So be exciting, but I, I definitely feel, and I know Les feels this way too, coaches and personnel that uh, we're going to come away with some players that we expect to help us um, a lot sooner than later. And then if I could follow up, uh, you guys have eight picks now. Um, Sean, we asked Les a lot about sort of his philosophy and acquiring more picks and, and I guess increasing the dart throws as, as he says, but I'm wondering how you guys have sort of developed and uh, evolved that philosophy in the moment uh, when teams are calling you or you're calling others wanting to, to trade back. And, and are you guys both happy with having eight picks or do you think you guys will be open for business for more? Yeah, I think the number one thing is, is there's, there's such consistent alignment, you know, between Les and myself and really, you know, his group and, and our coaches. And I think it boils down to, you know, eight picks right now, but, you know, it's really the players and identifying a handful of guys that you like. And if there's still a handful of guys at a certain spot or, you know, when you're on the board and you feel like you can move back and gain some more draft capital and it allows you to be able to add, you know, you know kind of a two for one, if you will, or even more than that. That's always something that, you know, I think Les has done a great job of, and I've really learned and, um, you know, seen it kind of unfold these last five years. Uh, but it's, um, you know, it's a good thing. And, and a lot of those decisions are uh, unfolding in the moment. And, you know, Les gets real frenetic in a good way as the clock starts ticking down. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's fun for us. <laughs> you didn't like that, huh, Les? I, I did mention on Chris Long's podcast yesterday that, during the season, I may be the frontal lobe and you're the amygdala, but during this time of the year, you're the frontal lobe and I'm the amygdala. But there you go. Nick. That's a nice way of saying that less is the basket case. Now I'm the basket case during the season. <laughs> Although I, I, I can say that, uh, you know, as, as the clock's winding down, that I, I got a gut feeling that like Sean calling plays on a drive to win the Super Bowl. Like mom, dad, something genetically gifted, whatever it is. I just think your heart rate's a little better than mine. So I'm probably doing what I should be doing, and you're probably doing what you should be doing. We're a good team. Hey, guys, uh, Coach and uh, Les, uh, thank you for taking time off for this. I wanted to ask you guys just about the draft. I know you guys look at obviously study hours upon hours of film and things of that nature, but how far do you guys go back as far as looking at? the type of player that you want to be inside of your, your, you know, clubhouse inside of the, the, the culture that you guys have created. How far do you go back to determine not just what, what's on the field, but what's between the ears and, and the type of characteristic of the person is that will fit your scheme? Uh, you know what? We probably, probably as far back as, as high school, definitely with, with players that uh, we're really interested in, we will definitely, you know, connect with, 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 not just coaches, but probably teachers and people in the community of, of where the, the the young man grew up, and and that's probably about as far back as we go. And and a lot of that, and seeing seeing the right the patterns of how he's developed and matured over the years, and and see if we can figure out a pattern of right uh, where he's progressing. Uh, and and that's probably and, and every now and then we'll we'll go back and probably probably look at a huddle highlight tape of some really good players of them probably dominating high school football. Uh, but that's usually for fun, mental break in the draft. Stu? Hey, Sean, what's been the value of these late round picks or players turning into uh, key contributors for you guys? I think the key is identifying guys that, that we have a vision for, Stu, that, that, that fit within, you know, our culture, but, but also, you know, fit for some of the, you know, the, the voids that we might have or the, way, the, the areas of need, um, that they have certain traits and skill sets that, that complement and accentuate the other 10 guys that they'll be playing with, whether that's on offense, defense, or special teams. But 
I think there's a clear cut vision. You know, there's certain players Stu, that I think uh, all 32 teams would agree that this is an elite fit, um, you know, but being able to have a vision as you get later, identifying certain traits and characteristics that fit within the framework, how you envision utilizing them and helping them reach their highest potential. And, you know, usually in a lot of those uh, situations, you're betting on the human being and kind of looking at the history and, and the way that they're wired and, and their background and uh, some of the things they bring to the table. But but it's having a vision um, where there's a consistent buy in and uh, a willingness to try to help these guys, uh, you know, reach their highest potential in, in, in every single avenue. You know what I'll add to this, Sean, because I think I've said it a lot. and I think it, it's something that needs to be said. It's one thing to identify. It's another thing to acquire. It's another thing to develop. But I, I think I've said it a few times, right, uh, this year that I give Sean his staff credit. Is they, they've actually, right, determined that they're going to rely on players in key roles that are on, that are in their rookie contracts. And that that's that's maybe the hardest part of that equation of all the variables that go into that calculus. So I give Sean and his staff credit for actually saying this. It's one thing to acquire and develop. It's another thing to say, you know what, we're penciling him into the lineup and we're going to rely on that young man during the rookie contract. Thank you both. And going back to that last question, it, big Derek Henry's highlight tape from Uly, Florida. I mean, holy cow, I don't know if he got tackled. I don't, if, I, if my son would have been playing against Derrick Henry High School, I'd have said, you're sitting this one out, buddy. Claudia? This question is for both. How are you, first of all? Good. Uh, how important would it be to draft defensive players, especially outside linebackers and edge rushers? Claudia, we love people who can rush the pass. Key is, is would there be any on the board? We go to pick it. Sean, you can elaborate. That's the question. No, I, I think it's um, I think it's an important thing, Claudia, but, you know, there's certainly needs that we have on both sides of the football, and there's a lot of players that we've identified that we think uh, will be there at 104, 142, and, and some of our other picks that, that we feel like can help this squad. And so I think it's a combination of, you know, some of the needs that we have and, and then, you know, best player available and, and looking at, you know, what the landscape of the draft looks like projection-wise um, at some of those spots and how that affects and influences your decision-making process in the moment. And last one is, do you have an interest in making the offensive line deeper with Ward left a big hole? Yeah, I think we've got some guys that we've invested in that we think have tremendous upside that we're looking forward to watching those guys compete. Um, but that's always a position that you can never have enough depth. And I think that's been a, a real benefit. Even when you go back to the 19th season where we had to play a lot of these young guys, I think that's really served us well up front each of the last two years, being able to develop that depth, having guys that have played a lot of meaningful games, whether it's looking at all the snaps Joe Nobooms played, Bobby Evans has played in key and critical situations. You look at when David Edwards and, and Corbett stepped into it, you know, you go back Austin Blythe, Brian Allen. So, um, you know, we've had a lot of guys that, uh, you know, have stepped in. You look at Alaric Jackson in the, in the Minnesota game where he plays the majority of the game at left tackle. Coleman Shelton played a lot of good football. So those are always really important positions to develop depth at because um, you're going to probably have to rely on them at some uh, point in the season to be able to win key critical games, to be able to get into the playoffs and, and play games after uh, the regular season um, if you're competitive enough. Thank you, guys. Great. Hey, Les. Uh, Sean just touched on this briefly, but I think we ask you this every year, but just to sort of reiterate your philosophy being a front office that uh, has been in a unique position like you have for the last few years, how do you evaluate drafting in areas of need versus best player available and what goes through your, your process there in general? If you could just reiterate that. I think you, the, the, I think would you definitely identify your needs and, and you, you know what those are. And then sometimes I call there's, there's also some, I call them wants, right. Where there's maybe some positions that, that you could add to, to help you, maybe not necessarily a need. Now the, the goal and the vision is to engineer a process where, uh, you then go about setting the board and getting that right and trying to eliminate some of the bias of knowing what your needs are because what you probably don't want to have happen is at the position of need you all of a sudden have a lot more players at that position 
just because you need them. And, and at that point, you in, in this case, right, picking 104, we'll probably have four to five positions that we'd like to pick from. And if we've done the, the work, uh, if we've done the correct work previously, then w- when we get to 104, we'll be able to look up the board and, and, and hopefully at one of those four to five positions, there'll be a, you know, a favorite player of ours and, and you go, you go from there. And what that does is definitely uh, you're attempting to eliminate uh, reaching at a position where if a player is a little less on your board, but at a position of need, you really, you really got to work through those before the draft to really know when there is a line and, and not let, let's call it the desperation of a need, uh, you know, blur that vision. Perfect. Thank you. Dusty. Uh, Hi, gentlemen. Um, Following less uh, following up on uh, uh, I guess Greg's question just now a little bit. Uh, last year, you guys were talking about uh, Raheem Morris having coined the phrase "pool party grade prospects." Um, you know, if you yes. got them, if you got them, you'd have a pool party. You were at you're drafting 57th last year. This is 104th. Are there are there pool party players at 104th, 140 something? You know what the phrase is is definitely still alive and well in the draft room. Now, maybe the pool's a little shallower. Maybe we shouldn't dive into the pool. But <laughs> uh, I do, and I, 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 I think this is a, a relatively deep draft, and I do think what we've tried to do is, is, again, handicap the draft, and then, you know, as the draft, right, as it, as it occurs, you know, you're gonna, there's going to maybe be players of less talent, but there's still players who might have, right, specific skill sets that can, contribute can fill a role uh can develop into something so we've tried to do, you know do a good job at each phase of the draft almost have a pool party pod for each phase but raheem's pool party uh phrases alive and well did you have Even that pick 104 did you have reason for that party last year as it turned out you know there was definitely a few uh pool party moments last year I, and, I, and i say that by if we if we, you know, we did call them pods, right? Where you, all right, these are pool party pods. So we did, we did get a few players that were in the, let's call it real, real fun pool party pod. And then just a quick one that's for both of you. Um, I don't know how rare it is, but you had starters on a Super Bowl team that you had drafted in every round from Aaron Donald in the first round to, I think, Nick Scott in the seventh. Um, is that as good a hallmark as you can think of a source of pride in uh, sort of having done a, done a good job with drafts over the years that you wind up with starters all the way from top to bottom in the, in the draft? love to hear both of your thoughts. Go ahead. So, yeah, I I think it's a positive. I I think the thing that you're always trying to do is uh, create the most competitive roster that you have, you know, whether it's guys that are contributing that were, you know, college free agents. You look at what a, a big piece Troy reader was for our football team. Christian Roseboom ends up coming in as uh, you know, even though I know he went to Kansas city and came back, but then you see guys like Nick Scott that you mentioned, like Bryson Hopkins, who really hadn't played step up in big roles, Kendall Blanton, you know, so there's so many different guys that, that contributed. And I think that's where you take a lot of pride as, you know, our onboarding process, whether it's draft free agency, you look at some of the trades, I mean, you know, you know, with what Matthew was able to do. So I think there's a lot of reasons to say you feel really good about the depth of our team, the competitiveness, the mental toughness. And I think that's a credit to the less his group, our coaches, um, and really the atmosphere and the environment. And I think a big part of that too, is, you know, you look at, you know, Jock McClendon, you look at Reggie Scott, his group, you look at Brendan Berger, you know, even, you know, Dan Demetrison in video, you know, there's so many people that these players work with Justin Lovett leading our strength staff. And so everybody has a hand um, in trying to help cultivate an environment and an atmosphere that helps these guys reach their highest potential, have belief, have the mental toughness. And, and I think, um, you know, whether it's guys that are, you know, in all parts of where you're drafting or just onboarding, I think that's what you take a huge sense of pride in. And, and those guys being able to deliver and, and find a way to get it done in, in a lot of, uh, you know, adverse moments in the midst of uh, finishing that out the right way. 
Les, any thought on that? You know, if I add anything on that, I, I think we, you know, if I took you inside the draft and I don't think it's any state secret, but we don't necessarily in our grading scale, we don't necessarily grade by round. We really try to, I, I, we, we like to say a lot of times in the draft room that when you're, when you're actually right. Uh, setting your depth chart when Sean and his staff is, is penciling in the 48 man roster, you, you're never, it's never draft round is never mentioned. So what we try to do in the draft prep is, right, is, hey, with each player, what role can they fill? What specific role can they fill? And, and some of them, right, there's, there's a role of, of you know, projecting uh, growth and, and upside and things like that. And that might be the role at that particular pick. So point being, like you said, we, I, th- I think that helps us because we're not really drafting. You know, we're not really grading players by round. It's like what can they do to help the Rams? in 2022 and then what might they be able to do uh in years beyond that thanks here hey uh les uh thanks for doing this um you know you guys met you mentioned cooper cup but uh Mm -hmm. you guys have had a lot of success uh, with the players that you've drafted in the third round since john arrived on the scene why do you think you guys have been able you know that those that particular round has, has paid off so well for you. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, yeah, going back to one of those questions on me that when we drafted John Johnson, uh, right? He was a late third round pick, and that year safety wasn't we weren't you know, that we that, that need wasn't a, it wasn't screaming at us we need a safety. But I think Ozzy knew us some coined the term one time or something similar where hey you can always can't have enough good football players on your team and it will usually work out. And, and that's that's probably one of those instances where you do use the board. But I do think, Gary, to answer your question is second, third round, even into the I mean, there's there is a lot of players in college football that probably end up falling into those rounds just based on the depth and how good college football is that, you know, they're just good football players that are going to find ways right to contribute to start in the NFL. And and it's a little sometimes I, I it, it's a little Maybe not easier, but refreshing in that when you're picking earlier, uh, you're often trying to pick maybe, you know, you're trying to find a freak, something freakish, something wow, where usually when you get in the second, third, fourth round, you're just, hey, let's let's find players that can play good football for us. Mm-hmm. John? Yeah, I, I think it's just the human beings. I think it's by chance. You know, when you talk about those two players, those are really special players. We uh, – we knew they were going to be that good. We certainly wouldn't have probably waited till the third round to take them. I think, uh, I think you had a, like, I think it goes back to the vision, but it's the human being. It's the makeup. It's the ability they have. It's the way that their brain processes the game. And it's why John earned a big contract with the Browns and why Cooper did with us and why both those guys are two of the more productive players at their position um, in this entire league. And then, um, you know, you got your team uh, released a, uh, a movie trailer, uh, today uh with you guys not starring in it with people actually playing your roles i'm just curious uh you know what you thought of the, the trailer and if you were upset that the you you weren't able to play yourself well i think uh i think les's hairdo certainly looks better in the draft video than it does on this zoom call <laughs> <laughs> you know no, i'm just kidding <laughs> Yeah, you know they went Greg? throwback. They went throwback less, you know, the early <laughs> days of the GM less here. But uh, I thought they did a great job. You know, I mean, you talk about the amount of work that went on behind the scenes and it came together really well. Um, got a chance to kind of, you know, have some insight on, you know, how it all unfolded. And, um, you know, I think Les and I both felt pretty good about it. And I know Raheem Morris certainly feels really good that Tyree skips and played him. So he's been walking around with his chest out all day today. Les, you know what? Uh, they, they did a lot better job than I would have done. So I'm, I'm, I'm thumbs up. Ain't, you know, Josh played myself a lot better than you know I walked daily life. Although I, there was, you know, I was a big Josh fan and, and lost, but you know, I started watching Yellowstone. He was a little bit of a villain in Yellowstone, so I was conflicted when when he won the park. Hey, but, there's you know, Tyrese. He did a heck of a job. <laughs> and then uh, finally. You know, last year you guys um, were drafting out of that house in, in Malibu. Uh, this, this year you're going to be up in the Hollywood Hills. Um, 
how do you how do you like the setup this year and you know how do, how do you foresee that uh, that operation working? I think it's a it's a great setup. I mean, you know, you look at just the the setting, the views, the the house. It's incredible. I think for us, the most important thing is the functionality. Um, Dan and Jeff Graves do such a great job of getting all those things set. And I'll be glad that uh, Les and I are in person together since he hopefully knock on wood won't catch COVID in, uh, you know, today. <laughs> and you know what, Gary, I, I have, a, I can't stop staring at my hair now in this Zoom camera. <laughs> Sean, Sean's giving me a complex. You know, Kurt? I, I got a couple of hats over here I may put on. <laughs> Uh, you look good. <laughs> hey, uh, gentlemen, as you stack your board, um, I've heard both of you kind of talk about the makeup as the person. Bobby Knight once said, um, mental is to physical as two is to one. Does that apply here? Is that what Cooper Cup became? And the guys that maybe were projected higher and didn't fit, fit out, how much does the mental aspect fit into the equation of stacking that board? I think it's a big part. I think we'll keep it simple. We have a calculus formula. There's a player has some, uh, right. It's been gifted with uh, some level of physical talent. Uh, you add in the intangibles, the conscientiousness, the, the ability to process football. And at the end of the day, that's going to equals, that's going to equal his skill on Sunday afternoons. So uh, a lot of these players that we get to look at, right. They have the talent. I do think the intangibles and whatever mixture that is, is really what, really what leads to right the skill on Sundays. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I think uh I think when you look at it, you know, I, I I always like the reference. I saw a documentary on the way back from the combine a handful of years ago in search of greatness. And um one of the people that had done a lot of studies on you know these great and they were studying athletics in particular. And you know you're talking about the Williams sisters, Jerry Rice, Wayne Gretzky, Kobe, Michael you know, Tom Brady, Peyton, you know, all these guys that are great in, in different arenas, you know, Tiger Woods, Roger Federer, Nadal. And they said the two things that all these guys and people and athletes had in common was a rage to master and the ability to pick things up quickly in, in their domain. And I think, you know, that's all above the neck type of stuff. People that are intrinsically motivated, that have a good feel and instincts for whatever their craft is. And that is why it's a huge part. And I think when you talk about those players that have really shined, um, that's a big reason why they've separated themselves because of the mental makeup. And I think it's a huge part. And Les, just one quick follow-up for you. At 104, do you, you had said earlier that you kind of expect there'll be three or four guys there. In your allotted window, do you anticipate it'll be a done deal in terms of the communication in the room? Can you kind of take us through what would happen if there's a, a split? Yeah, I, I don't think there'll ever be a, a split. I think we'll, you know, I think anybody we have on our board that we're saying we would pick at 104, right, is pretty much, we're aligned in, in those players. Now, if, if we get there and and let's say there's four players at four different positions available, I mean, that could be a discussion as well. A lot of times that, a lot of times we say that, that those decisions will be made for us, especially when you're picking that far back. Is is there's likely there won't be, right? Our six, our bet. I mean, our favorite players in that pod to draft there at six different positions. It might be three, and and we will talk through those scenarios beforehand. So we'll we'll be pretty much aligned when we when we get in there, and and then there, and then at times, right there, it might be where uh, there's a certain position group that uh, maybe feels a little left out, but that's natural in in the draft. But we've discussed that. There's no one that's going to be truly alive and well for us to pick at 104 that we will not be aligned right uh as as a as a football team and if there's a lot of players there that's when you you can think about trading back and things like that that's why that's why you always let the board help you right make decisions and think for you uh right as you go through those those moments appreciate it guys thank you Hey, Les, can you address um, how you value the 40-yard dash as you're going through the uh, draft process? You know what? Some, you know, some players prove the 40-yard dash wrong. And, and then, you know what? Some players, uh, we don't listen to our own Bobby Wagner rule. And, you know, we wait till the third round because they run slower 40s instead of picking them a little early. 
Yeah, I respect it. I respect uh, I respect that that process. I you know I I, I got to give uh, uh, and I believe that was Cooper, right? I'm yes. pretty sure that was Cooper. He's left the screen, but he did challenge me recently. Like, oh, tell me about your Bobby Wagner rule. And he, and he had that look, and I was like, yeah, Cooper, we we didn't listen to our own rule on you. We we tried to do, uh, handicap the draft because of the 40 time. It worked out for us, but uh, at that point in time, we, we should have followed the Bobby Wagner rule somewhere. He picked you a little earlier. Dennis? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Leslie. Good afternoon, uh, Coach McVay. How are you guys doing today? Good. How are you doing, Dennis? Doing great. As far as looking for a good fit for the team, is um, playing or having the ability to play special teams, is that a key component for what you're looking for in uh, the players? I think it depends on, uh, you know, what the vision is, where you're picking, things like that. You know, obviously anybody that has a little bit more uh, position, versatility, and flex based on being able to contribute, that is a big part of it. Um, you know, I think we've we've identified certain guys that, that have done a great job of kind of being core players for Joe D, but that's certainly a part of it. But I think that um, – conversation comes up, you know, depending upon what pick you're, you're exactly talking about. But uh, I think when you get into that fourth round or the late in the third round and, and later on, you know, that versatility, usually those guys that, that um, are pretty good on offense and defense, I got a tough time believing that it doesn't translate to being able to play well in space based on, um, you know, your body type and things like that. So the answer is yes. Um, and it gets a little bit more specific uh, depending upon where we're talking about and, and what we envision the role being for, for that player, Dennis, if it does work out the way we're supposed to, the way that, you know, we project it, if you will. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, Kev, you got two quick ones. We've got to get back to draft means we can we do this real quick. Thanks, guys. Yeah, just real quick. Um, so as, as y'all's uh, defensive scheme in particular um, has evolved over the last couple of years and you have a player like Jalen Ramsey on the back end. How has that changed the traits that you specifically look for? And I get, you know, obviously I think it applies to Aaron as well. When you have guys who are doing multiple things, um, what sort of traits then do you look for? Uh, and I'm thinking particularly in your defensive backfield between safeties and corners and how has that sort of helped shape and inform your, your scheme and vice versa moving forward? I don't know if those guys necessarily change the traits that you're looking for, but you can do certain things with those players that, you know, create less stressful downs for those other 10 or those other nine guys around them because of the attention or your ability to be able to kind of move the hard down. It's a little bit different when you start looking at, you know, Aaron, because in the known pass downs, he's going to dictate a lot of attention. Usually, you know, the center is going to turn to him, but there's different ways of, getting in certain front structures that that kind of help us out based on what their rules are. Are they protecting the five, six, seven? Uh, what type of action is it? If they are throwing the football, how are they wanting to run it? You know, and then Jalen's versatility. I think both of these guys' versatility, where Aaron can play all over the front, Jalen can play all over the back end, really just serves as a, at a benefit to us so that, um, you know, you can do a lot of different things around them. It's important to have, you know, guys that complement those skill sets, but um, you know, those guys are the ones that, that enable you to be really creative. And, and then I think in a lot of instances, some of their teammates can be big beneficiaries of that. Desti? Les, you talked about the possibility of trading back from 104. Feel obliged to ask, uh, are there scenarios, uh, any chance that you could trade up? There's, there's definitely always. Twitter's chance. not going off on who we just traded, Kevin? You haven't gotten that yet? Go on, Wi-Fi Les. doesn't work. <laughs> Just moved up into the first round. Wait till you see who it is. <laughs> so, yes, you can always trade up, Kevin. I doubt we got the ammo to get into that first round, but you know what? Sean's persistent. I'm sure he can talk us into being creative at some point. But, uh, yeah, that, I'll, that, that option's always available. I, I do think probably based on where we're picking and – and the amount of picks we have, you, we'd probably rather come away with, with more shots 
uh, right at the basket than less, but there is always a possibility. Uh, and you got to be cognizant of that when, when someone slips or you want to, you want to attack in, instead of retract. 